Well, I think if, um, if Miranda, Bianca, and Jacinta, if you're ready to get started, we can go ahead and dig in. Sound good? Getting the thumbs up. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Adina Duke. I'm the Associate Director for Public Engagement at the Spencer Museum of Art. Welcome to our first public edition of A Curiosity of Cabinets, Collections Care at Home. We actually piloted this program with members of the Spencer Museum and KU Libraries earlier this year and over the summer. And thanks to the great insights of and support from those of you who are members, we're really thrilled to be able to continue this series and welcome all of you to learn about the power of preventive conservation and how our practices at the museum and libraries may be applied to your collections at home. So whether you are a serious collector, a casual collector, or an artist, or seeking comfort in family treasures, or have been sorting through cabinets and closets with all the extra time you've had at home this year, this series is for you and it offers practical tips that you can enact today to better care for your collections. We also understand that you've missed visiting the museum and libraries as fully, so we're bringing our collections to you as examples while sharing lesser known, lesser known sides of their stories. Each of these sessions focuses on a particular type of material and today's spotlight is of course on paintings. So we'll go ahead and share our screen now because we do have slides prepared for you. Thank you, Miranda. Um, so pictured here are actually two images of a painting that's currently on view at the Spencer Museum, which some of you may have seen as it's pictured on the left. However, you're also seeing it in a new light on the right. The painting is titled Morning in the Adirondacks and it was created in 1867, shortly after the end of the Civil War by Sanford Gifford. It pictures a majestic mountain range rising behind a valley with a still body of water and a shoreline in the foreground. A log cabin sits squarely between an area of dense forest and barren clear-cut land. And the whole scene glows in a soft peach and lavender light of sunrise. It's around four by three and a half feet and it's set in a gold frame. And on the right, it's being examined under ultraviolet or UV radiation, which casts that blue tone over the painting and reveals an area that appears darker as a result of being treated by a conservator. I'm starting here because interestingly, this painting is neither in the collection of the Spencer Museum nor KU Libraries, but it has been on loan to the museum from KU Housing since 1995. So we can go to the next slide. It was gifted um, to the University Housing Department in 1954 from Joseph R. Pearson, who gave the painting with the intention it be displayed in the dorms because he so believed that students would benefit from living directly with art. As you can see um, more recently in, in the picture on the right, they are still living with art. Um, but if any of you have lived in a dorm or can sort of transport yourself to that environment, uh, you can imagine that also presents a variety of risks. And so mitigating those risks is what we call preventive conservation. As this painting moved around within housing over the years, and we can move to the next slide again, uh, as it moved around, it did sustain some damage and required interventive conservation to repair that damage. And it was at that point that housing and the museum determined it would be both safer and accessible to a wider student body and the general public by physically relocating it to the museum. I I think it's sort of a compelling place to start because it calls to mind for me ideas about campus collections more broadly, which in this context, I invite you to uh, use your imagination and think of it as a family collection um, and the different units of the university as individual family members. So extending this analogy raises questions about family dynamics and the kinds of joint decision making that transpires about the care of personal collections over the years. Whenever I visit my grandmother, I'm always looking around and thinking, oh, we should really move that thing out of direct light. Um, but it's not my, my object or not my object yet. Um, so I'm really thrilled to co-moderate today's session with my colleague and paper conservator, Jacinta Johnson, and we'll pass it over to you, Jacinta, to introduce yourself and our guests. Great, thank you, Adina. Um, I'm Jacinta Johnson and I am the Associate Conservator for the Andrew W. Mellon Conservation Initiative at KU. I work in a shared position between KU Libraries and the Spencer Museum of Art, where I treat works on paper from both collections and advise on their preventive care. So in our past Curiosity of Cabinet sessions, we've covered the care of books, photographs, works on paper, textiles, and digital collections. And we really utilize the experience and knowledge of the individuals that are listed here who serve the museum or the libraries. 
And this sharing of resources is one of the goals of our Mellon grant and as we continue connecting the libraries and the museum around collections care. So today we're expanding our series to include another specialty that is very critical to collections care and that is paintings conservation. And I'm very pleased and honored to introduce our two special guests today. Miranda Dunn is a conservator of paintings at ConserveArt Associates, a fine art conservation studio in Los Angeles, specializing in paintings and murals, and an associate project conservator for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Bianca Garcia is a conservator of paintings at the Balboa Art Conservation Center in San Diego and serves as the program manager for the Andrew W. Mellon Opportunity for Diversity and Conservation. So please offer them a warm virtual welcome. So our guest speakers have really gone the extra mile for you today to include examples of paintings from our very own Spencer Museum and KU libraries. This was accomplished in big part to the great efforts of both institutions to offer wonderful digital content. And you can explore their collections using the links that are provided here. I would also like to mention that all of the paintings shared today from the library's collections are currently on view at the Kenneth Spencer Research Library, including one from the current exhibition curated by Elspeth Healy called Imagined Worlds, Writers and the Process of Speculative Fiction, which offers a peek behind the scenes to explore the impassioned, messy, deliberative, contentious, and inventive processes involved in writing science fiction and fantasy. You can visit the ex exhibit in person or explore virtually on the KSRL blog. Thanks so much, Jacinta. Um, examples from the Spencer Museum are also on view throughout the galleries and fully searchable on our website as well. I just want to add three quick housekeeping notes if you'll bear with me. One is that we're recording this session um, and to keep background noise down, we appreciate everyone staying muted um, except when you're speaking. And if we can't detect, or if we, if we detect noise that we can't pinpoint, we may mute you temporarily. So forgive us for that if we do. Uh, we love seeing you on camera, but if you do prefer to be incognito, just click stop video at any time. And if you are experiencing any um, freezing or unstable connections, that can also improve your connection. We're pleased to provide closed captioning thanks to support from the Mellon Foundation, and you can just click the CC button to turn on the captions. Finally, we are counting on you to help us make this a dynamic dialogue. And so there is a chat button where you can type your questions and comments throughout. Jacinta and I will be monitoring them and we'll be, have, we'll be sure to have lots of time at the end um, to discuss those. We also have several Spencer staff who are on here as well. So they, I suspect, might um, provide some really helpful um, answers in the chat as we go and might have some fun facts to add as well. Um, if we experience technical issues on our end, we may need to end early, but we will hope for the best. So we've got roughly 45 minutes of great content for you, but would like to bookend our time together by hearing about the paintings that you have in your collections, the stories they tell, and the questions and quandaries you have regarding their care. So we've created a quick poll for you, which I'm going to launch now. And give everyone just a minute here to let us know either what you have at home or what you're interested in learning about. And I'll share the results once things level off. Looks like people are still actively engaged, so give it another second here. Some of the terms you may not be familiar with, so um, hopefully you'll have answers to those here as we go as well. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Okay. Um, you all are very, uh, this is a Zoom question. You all are very large on my right hand side and that blocks off some of the things you're putting up. Is there some way I can make everything fit? Yeah, so there, there's a slider in the middle of the, the, the people and the presentation. And so if you put your cursor on the slider, you should be able to drag it to the left or the right to adjust. Slider? Where? Yeah. Um, if you put your cursor between the, the people and the slides, um, there should be like two little vertical lines and you should be able to drag that left or right. 
And while we're working on that, I'm going to show everyone the results here. Aha. All the, the only thing I can click on says hide the hide the non view for participate for participants. Have non video for participants. It's like, mm. yeah. Try oh. up at the top. There's also view options, okay. and you can select different view options up there. Okay. Give that a shot. Whoop! No, nope. yeah. just brought got rid of everybody else. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nope. There you go. Checking Whoop. side by side mode to see if that helps. So, um, looking at the poll here, oil paintings is the clear winner. Um, and interestingly, we, we have a, a, a graduated um, a form, which is interesting to see. So, I will stop sharing those results, um, but we will be sure to cover that, um, each of those materials as we go. Um, so, let's see. Um, Carol, are you good now? Do you have everything situated? Oh, now you're on mute. Um, okay, you so still, you still are blocking and I can't figure out how to get you smaller. Okay. I will, I will send you a, a private chat and we'll see if we can get that figured out for you. Okay. Um, so let's just take maybe one or two volunteers. If anyone has brought something that they can safely handle or has a question that they'd like to ask about paintings care, um, just to kind of warm ourselves up and then we'll dive into the presentation and save lots of time at the end for more Q&A and sharing. Does anyone have a painting question or Hi, I have a question. Um, I'm Arelli Marina. I am also a, I'm a K professor upstairs. And I was so excited to see that the session was happening because I moved into a new house with an open plan. And now my paintings are in the same airspace as my kitchen. In fact, right now I'm standing next to a 17th century oil painting on panel that is about 12 feet from the pan where I'm frying onions. And so things are getting coated with, with household like grease and dust. And I don't know what to do about that other than like move. So that's, that's basically my question. How do we take care of works of art that are in environments that are very unlike um, the kinds of environments we'd like to keep them in? I'm happy to show you the picture if you like, but I'm not sure it's helpful at this point. Let's see. Bianca, can I take this? Do you want to take this? I saw you. Uh, <laughs> this is a case where I would recommend glazing the painting or even putting it in a micro environment if you're concerned about humidity and temperature levels fluctuating in the space. This is a case where you cannot control the air, the environment around the painting, so then therefore you must like just encapsulate the painting in. It's like it's an own little bubble. Right. Um, to follow up, I can control the temperature and the, um, the humidity well. What I cannot control is the fact that there are basically oil particles in the air, other than literally not ever cooking. But if you glaze it, then you'll just have to clean the glazing, which is super Yeah, cool. so glazing is probably the strategy. Okay, yeah. thank you. But there's, other than glazing, there's, no, there's nothing between. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. That's good to know. Yeah, I've definitely treated paintings that clients kept in the kitchen and then they come and covered in kitchen grease, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. And actually, Bianca will be talking about the different places in a home that are, are safer than others. Um, yeah. Does anyone Thank else have a painting or a question that they'd like to share? Just a question. My paintings are from the 19th century and they've been in the family forever. And one of them is really dark. And so I guess I'm asking, what can I do to bring it back? I think we'll probably answer that question in the presentation. Great. Um, but I'm happy to give you a little preview and, um, and tell you that 
likely it's discolored varnish. And if you take it to a conservator, they'll, I'm sure that there will be um, a difference after cleaning. Yeah, it sounds right. like your painting needs treatment. <laughs> Definitely. I think that my great grandfather smoked and it was in that room, basically. Uh, so that will do it. <laughs> yeah. So who's, I mean, cigars or whatever. But um, so at some point, will you give us a conservator in this air, in the Lawrence area or Kansas City area, or do we send it away later what? on? Yeah, we'll be we'll be talking about that. And both of these questions are really preparing us for what's to come. So maybe we'll dig right in and um, I'm sure it will elicit a lot more questions for afterwards. So Miranda, we'll turn it over to you. I don't know what just happened, but uh, maybe you did somebody did you just start sharing Adina? No. It's a painting with a card. Yes, that's me. I'm sorry. I was just rushing to beat the deadline on this, but this is an oil painting from my mother who painted it in the 60s, and it's, um, it's called The Gallery of the Sad Jacks, and it's uh, got a lot of cracks in the oil, and I have a close-up one. I, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but um, the... Uh, yeah, there it is. Mm. The, the oil has cracked, and mm -hmm. or the varnish, or whatever it is. But the, the um, she has several paintings from this era of time, and I, all of them, I think, need some kind of work. So I need to know who locally. I'm from Lawrence. Can help me find someone to make a conservation or restoration possible and their contact information and uh, that's my my story great thank you for for having a photo ready to share because that helps um paint the picture for all of us um but yeah miranda or bianca just into any thoughts on that um i mean it definitely looks like there might be some lift and cracking and he is totally right that he needs to work with a conservator on that. Um, I think Miranda will go over um, how to work with a conservator, how to find a conservator in your area. And we have uh, allowed for a lot of time at the end for more Q&A and we'll revisit these questions and give others a chance to chime in too. Yeah. And I guess that example also brings up, you know, uh, paintings that do have cracks um, on them that are perfectly stable, um, but just need a conservator's eye to be able to say, yes, you're fine as is, you don't need to take any action. Um, so yeah. having, uh, having a conservator help you distinguish between what is, is actively deteriorating um, and needs to be stabilized versus just kind of taking care of it as is, so. That's a really great point. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, we'll continue with questions and, and sharing after the presentation and we'll turn it over to you, Marissa, and I will be filling the chat with a few fun facts about collections as we go. Okay. Um, if everyone doesn't mind pressing mute. Um, okay, great. So let's talk about paintings. They vary in materials, style, and technique. Here we have two paintings from the Spencer collection that are very different in support material and style, but they're both painted in oil and were painted within 50 years of each other. These are the parts of a typical painting. As you know, paintings come in many forms, but this is a good outline of a typical Western painting on canvas. Working from the bottom up, we have the auxiliary support or the secondary support, which would be the stretcher or the strainer, the primary support, which in this case would be the canvas, the ground layer, any preparatory layer or underdrawing, the paint layer, and then the varnish layer. Now let's look at each of these elements more closely. There are many supports that have been used by artists for paintings. When fabric is used, there's almost always a rigid support to maintain tension in the fabric. 
A stretcher can be metal or wood, and it, if it can be keyed out, expanded, it's called a stretcher because it can stretch the canvas. You can see in the image on the left, those little things in the, in the corners, those are keys, and those help expand the canvas, expand the stretcher, which expands the canvas. If the support size and shape cannot be changed, it's called a strainer. We see that in, in the image on the right. Panel, copper, glass, bone, stone, all different types of composite boards, walls, pretty much anything you can think of, anything that will sit still long enough has been used as a support at one time or another, especially by contemporary artists. But these are some more common examples. On the left is an image, uh, an example of a typical 15th century Italian panel painting in the Spencer Museum collection. European paintings from this period were almost always painted on panel and the wood type depended on the region. On the right, we have a canvas painting in the KU collection, in the KU, li KU library collection. It's by John Eldridge and it's of Gail Sayers, not John Eldridge King, and it's, a, by, it's of Gail Sayers. Gail Sayers was born in Wichita, Kansas and played football for KU where he was nicknamed the Kansas Comet and twice recognized as an All-American. Sayers passed away earlier this year. So canvas began to be used by artists in around the 1600s and it's probably the most common support. We also see paintings on glass, usually painted on the reverse of the glass, as we see here in the Marcusi painting in the Spencer collection on the left. This painting of Krishna was painted on camel bone and the Kaufman was painted on copper. The region where the painting was created and the period of creation often dictate the materials. So you wouldn't expect to see a camel bone support on a painting from Germany, for instance. Each material presents different conservation issues and Bianca will talk more about those in a minute. Artists often paint on simple and less expensive materials too. For instance, this piece by Frank Fries was painted on matte board. Fries was one of science fiction and fantasy's best known illustrators. Depending on the support and the desired appearance, the artist might lay down preparatory layers. In the case of a panel painting, this would mean preparing the wood and then applying multiple layers of gesso, which is calcium sulfate and animal skin glue. You can see in the image here, the wood on the, all, all the way on the right side, and then the various layer, layers of gesso. It's, it's kind of a complex layering technique. Um, if there was going to be any gilding on the panel, they would apply a bowl layer so that the gold leaf would stick. The bowl is um, it's red clay mixed with animal skin glue so that the gilding would stick to it once it was wetted with either oil or water. So you can see um, that dark red line next to the gilding is bowl. For a canvas support, the artist would, or the company preparing the canvas, would likely apply a sizing layer to make the canvas less absorbent. And after that dried, they might apply a ground layer. Grounds can be colored to create an undertone for the painting, or in some areas, the artist doesn't completely cover the ground with paint, so it becomes a part of the composition. Imprimatura is an Italian word. It's um, an initial translucent stain of color, a laying out of shapes. It can sometimes be used as a middle tone of the composition itself. And then underpainting or underdrawing is a sketch or initial laying out of lines or figures where the artist is working out placement and proportions. You can see in the top left corner of this painting, the, the grid pattern and the underdrawing of, of the flowers. Um, often the underdrawing is different, at least slightly from the final composition. That can be really interesting to see what changes an artist made as they were, as they were painting. Over time, paints become more translucent. So sometimes we can actually see underdrawings with the naked eye that would not have originally been visible when the artist finished painting it. The paint layer, what makes a painting a painting? So paint, no matter what kind, is basically binder and pigment. There's a solvent or diluent that you use to thin out the paint or to solubilize it. For instance, with watercolors and acrylics, it's water. 
With oils, it's a stronger solvent like turpentine or white spirits. The pigments are suspended in the binder. These can be minerals or dyes that have been precipitated onto inorganic compounds. Some are ancient and are still used today and others are synthetic and were created more recently. Pigments can sometimes help us in dating a painting. So in the image, this is a painting um, painted in, in egg tempera, which means the binder was egg yolk. And anyone who eats eggs knows how sticky egg yolk gets the moment it dries. So, um, it's, so it's a, a great binder, but it dries really quickly. So you see the linear strokes in the painting. That's how you have to paint with, te with egg tempera because it dries so quickly, quickly, there's no blending or glazing like you would have in an oil painting. So that can help you figure out um, what, what type of paint was used on your painting. Um, also, all kinds of paints were used like house paints, et cetera. Um, varnish. Varnish is the final layer, but not all paintings are varnished. Why do artists varnish paintings? There are multiple reasons. Uh, varnish saturates the colors and often leaves a glossy finish. It also acts as a protective layer. For instance, accretions are much easier to remove from a painting that's been varnished without affecting the paint layer. Um, it can also act as a sacrificial layer, bearing the brunt of UV and light damage over the paint layer. Bianca will discuss light damage in a minute. Um, there are many types of varnishes, but two major classes. Natural resin varnishes, which tend to yellow more quickly, and synthetic varnishes, which also discolor over time, but not as rapidly. It's good to remember that all varnishes discolor over time. As you can see in the image, uh, the left side of the painting has been cleaned and the varnish has been removed, and the right side still has a layer of yellow varnish. Varnish can be applied by brush or it can be sprayed. Each technique has its benefits and can change the characteristics of the finish. The artist will sometimes tone a, a varnish. Turner was known for doing this. Um, you can imagine that that would, would be really challenging for a conservator who's trying to remove a discolored varnish. Um, how can we tell if something's varnished? We can examine the surface finish and can sometimes just tell by the sheen. Uh, we also examine paintings under ultraviolet radiation. Varnishes fluoresce in UV, and different varnishes have a characteristic color of fluorescence. So it can sometimes help us figure out what type of varnish has been used. Um, in the image, you see the milky yellowish haze that's obscuring the image of the virgin and child. I mean, yes, the virgin and child. Um, that's the fluorescing varnish layer under UV radiation. Some paintings should not be varnished. Like most things, there are fashions of the period. For instance, many Impressionist painters did not varnish their paintings. Um, during other periods and in other groups of artists, thick varnish was in vogue. So some artists were so opposed to having their paintings varnished that they wrote instructions not to varnish their paintings on the back. You can see that in the image on the left. Um, it's a great example of keeping documentation with a painting. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Um, painting on the back, I don't know if all of you were here yet, but we were speaking about it before, like where to sign your painting and where to put information and, and the back is, is always a good place. Um, and another way artists use varnish is by selective varnishing, uh, where they're able to vary the gloss of a painting by varnishing some areas and not others. The painting on the right by Bill Bridges was uh, who played basketball for KU, where he was named an All-American in 1961, is unvarnished and has a creamy, more matte finish. The nature of this painting would be completely different if the artist had varnished it. Frames. Frames can provide an important layer of protection for a painting. It protects the edges of the painting and the corners. If a painting were to fall off the wall, which ideally would never happen, but we all know it does. Um, the frame would likely take the brunt of the fall. The frame is also a means of hanging the picture. And obviously frames also add to the aesthetic of a painting. 
Um, it's not uncommon for the artist to create the frame for their painting as well, making the frame part of the artist's original work. In this case, we call it an artist's frame. We see this in the Rossetti on the left in the Spencer collection. On the right, we have an engaged frame, which is a frame that's common in altarpieces where the frame is built into the panel. What else is a painting? Um, a lot of that is up to interpretation. In one museum, a painted bark cloth like the one we see on the left would be considered a painting. And in another museum, the same piece would be considered an object. And the same goes for the mural we see on the right. I'm gonna pass it over to Bianca now. Thank you, Miranda. Hi, everyone. So, so far we have learned how a painting comes together, but now let's look at the different ways in which paintings can fall apart. I'm gonna go over some of the condition issues that are more commonly seen in paintings and the different ways in which we can prevent them, as well as some basic at-home care and handling of paintings. So, as we just learned from Miranda, paintings are three-dimensional mixed media objects. And all of these materials are hygroscopic, which means that they absorb and release water and are reactive to environmental conditions. The different materials will do so at different rates, and that's what leads to some of the more common issues that we see with paintings. Some of the things that I encounter the most when treating paintings are cracked, lifting, and lost paint, weak and torn canvases, layers of grime and discolored varnishes that obscure the true colors of the compositions, and quite often restoration work done by either the owner or an untrained restorer that can be challenging to reverse and sometimes damaging to the painting. So this painting here on the left pretty much has all of the above. When planning for the long-term care of your paintings, it's important to consider the factors that contribute to the overall change over time. Some of these factors cannot be completely stopped, but with some basic interventions, they can be slow to extend the life of your painting. We summarize these factors into what we call the 10 agents of deterioration. And here they are, all of them listed. And we use these as a kind of checklist to assess the risk levels for what our particular object and we set up interventions to mitigate these risks. I will now discuss the agents that affect paintings most often in our home collections. Physical forces is our first agent and they include most of the accidents that happen with paintings. Other agents can compromise the integrity of the materials so that they're weaker and more prone to damage. So for example, a deteriorated canvas is more prone to tearing than a brand new canvas. Here on the left, we have an image of the back of a painting and we can see a tear at the bottom left indicated by the yellow circle, as well as an older tear that was previously repaired with duct tape at the top right, and it's the black square that you see. Damage can also result from handling. On the right, we have an example of a painting I treated. It's oil on canvas and there are hundreds of eggshells glued to it. And you can see how many of the eggshells around the edges have broken off. Here on the left, we have an example of what I previously mentioned regarding heavy-handed restorations. A previous poor treatment caused even further damage. There was initially a tear that was made worse by someone sanding down the paint around it to smooth out the area. And then all of this was masked by overpaint. And the full extent of the initial damage and then the subsequent damage was only revealed when I cleaned the painting. On the right, we have an example of what's called rabbit abrasion and paint loss along the edge of the painting. The rabbit is the inner edge, the inner part of the frame in which your painting sits. And this kind of damage results from the painting rubbing against the frame or sticking to it. And I will later discuss different framing techniques that will help eliminate this type of damage. A common agent is pollutants. Uh, they, pollutants like dust can sit on the surface and be visually distracting. They can also interact with the varnish layer and some pigments resulting in discoloration. Uh, here we have an example of a painting halfway through cleaning. And this painting, when we were talking about this earlier, about smoking and paintings in the house, this painting had been in the house with smokers and the nicotine byproducts settle on the surface, giving the painting a very yellow appearance. 
This here on the left is an example of dust and dirt accumulating on the back of a painting. So not only does it look gross, but dust also attracts moisture, which can lead to problems in the paint layer, as you can see in the image on the right. Additionally, dirt can be food for pests, and we can see an insect on the left image. This leads us right into our next agent, which are pests. Things like plant fibers in the canvas, protein and the glue sizing of the canvas, and the wood of the stretchers, wood panels, and or the wood frames are all food for insects. You want to look for signs of an active infestation, such as frest. Frest is basically the poop, the poop of the insect, and it can be different colors depending on its, what it's been eating. So sometimes you can tell either which object in your collection or which area of your painting is at risk. Um, the frass is what looks like the sandy looking particles along the bottom of the strainer and also on top of the, oh, if you can go back. There. Uh, you also want to look for dead bugs or casings, which are the exterior skin that they shed, and exit holes. As the insects live inside the wood, they create tunnels, as you can see here on the image of the frame on the right. And when they come out, they leave tiny little pinholes. And this is what we see, all those dark dots on the image on the left. If you suspect that your artwork has an active insect infestation, you should isolate it from the rest of your collection until you can have it treated, because it can spread to other items. Now next, okay. Um, our next agent is light. And we tend to think of paper-based objects as being the most light sensitive. And while this is generally true, paintings can also be significantly affected by light. Light can either darken or lighten materials. And here we have an example of each. On the left, we have Van Gogh's sunflowers. And you can see how the once vibrant yellows have darkened and now appear a muted brown. On the left, we have a portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds, and he used a dye-based red pigment that is entirely faded due to light exposure, leaving the sitter looking quite pale. Most of our houses are flooded by daylight and it cannot be totally eliminated, but you can reduce the light levels with blinds and curtains, and you can also fit your windows with UV filtering film. You can also glaze your paintings with, oh, um, you can also glaze your paintings with UV filtering acrylic, which I will discuss in a little bit. And obviously you don't want to hang your painting in an area that receives direct sunlight, such as right in front of your window. It's important to remember that light not only affects the colors, but light is also a source of heat. So speaking of heat, incorrect temperature and incorrect relative humidity are our next two agents. These two are intricately connected as they are inversely proportional. Warm air holds more water and therefore the relative humidity is gonna be lower. Cold air holds less water and the relative humidity goes up. In the diagram at the bottom left, uh, we illustrate this. And you can see the same amount of water at different temperatures results in different humidity levels. Um, the graph on the right is also a clear example of how they mirror each other. While heat can certainly affect paintings, incorrect relative humidity tends to be the most common problem. As I mentioned in the beginning, most materials found in paintings are hygroscopic and sensitive to changes in relative humidity. I also mentioned that the different materials will react at different rates. So the canvas will move more with more it's going to expand and contract much more than the paint field. It was, the paint field will move to a certain extent, but much less and at a, lower, at a slower rate. So over time, these repeated cycles of high and low humidity will lead to cracks in the paint layer. And then as they keep moving over time, they will start to lift and eventually result in paint loss, as you see on the right. The next. Wood will expand and contract with relative humidity as well. If it's too dry, the wood can split, as you can see in the image of the back of a panel painting on the left. Dry conditions are most common in winter time, especially because of heating. If the humidity is too high, then wood can expand and distort, and the grain of the wood is gonna move, and that moving is also gonna result in lifting paint, like the, the detail of the image we see here on the right. High relative humidity can also lead to mold and blanching. 
Mold spores are ever present in the environment and will become active when you have relative humidity above 75 to 8%. On the far left, you can see mold stains on the back of a canvas. Sometimes mold will grow on the back for a long time without us realizing, so it's always good to check the back of your paintings. Humidity can also become trapped between the paint and the varnish layers, and this is what we call blanching, and it looks like a white haze. And you can see examples um, of kind of like spotty ones in the middle and more widespread ones on the right. Mold and salt efflorescence can also look very similar, so you want to make sure that you don't have like a mold growth on, on the top of your painting or salts because they can be quite damaging. So I will now go over some easy and simple things that you can do at home to care for your paintings and mitigate some of the damages that we have seen so far. Correct handling will prevent many accidents. You always want to use two hands, one on the side and one on the bottom is really optimal way to handle paintings as you can see here on the left. Our model Eric is wearing gloves, but you don't need to use gloves when handling paintings. You might want to wear gloves sometimes for like high polish finishes on some frames if you're concerned about fingerprints. If your painting is too large or heavy, you should definitely get some help. Do not grab your paintings by only one side like we see here. You never know when the frame or the stretcher or strainer is weak and structurally compromised and it can just like break off and your painting will fall to the ground. Handling on frame paintings can be sometimes a little challenging. So you just want to make sure that you're not wrapping your fingers around the back of the stretcher and poking against the canvas. This can lead to cracks on the front of painting like see here, seen here on the left. Proper framing can help preserve your painting. This on the left is an image of what the back of a painting on canvas should ideally look like. For paintings on canvas, we like to use backing boards, and these are usually made out of foam core or coroplast, blue board sometimes used. Coroplast is, has a structure that's really similar to cardboard with the fluting on the inside, but it's entirely made out of plastic. Some older backing boards are made out of cardboard, and well, they've done their job so far, ideally we should replace them as they can off gas and are acidic in nature. Um, backing boards also help keep out dust and insects and they protect against physical forces and they also help create, create a buffer zone which helps slow down the rate of exchange of if the relative humidity or the temperature change it creates a little air pocket that slows down that rate and gives the painting time to acclimate. The painting should be secured to the frame with mending plates which are the long metal hardware that you see. Um, and then you should use D-rings and braided wire to hang your painting. Here you have a detail of D-rings on the upper right. D-rings are better than eye hooks, which are the round little ones, because they have two points of attachment in case one fails, you always have a backup. And then the braided wire is thicker, um, so it if it snaps, it will start to fray instead of just like breaking. You should always line the rabbit of your frames with felt and I was, I promise I would talk about this. So like I said before, the rabbit is that inner edge of the frame in which the painting sits in and here the rabbit is the area that's covered by the black felt. Uh, this will prevent the rabbit, um, like this image that I showed you earlier, and also keep your painting from sticking to the frame. Sometimes it will stick to the frame and when you go to unframe it, you end up with little bits of paint stuck to the frame and losses on your painting. Here we have some examples of what not to use or do. On the far left, we have the side view of a painting that hangs with silk ropes. And while they are quite beautiful and very aesthetically pleasing, you can see that the rope has started to fray. And I know of a case where a painting fell off the wall because the rope snapped. In the middle, we have a photo of a painting that hangs from a single hook at the top. And this is commonly seen in older frames. And this is not very stable because the painting can swing on the wall. 
And like I said, only one point of attachment is not safe. On the lower right, we have one of my pet peeves, which are paintings secured to the frames with nails. So sometimes they will nail to the frame and they'll bend the nail to secure the painting to the frame. But the worst is when they nail through the stretcher and then into the frame, because as you go to and frame these paintings, you have to like dig holes into the stretcher or the stringer. Another big no-no for paintings is to use frame lights like you see in the top right. This incandescent light emits a lot of heat and eventually it will lead to damage in that section of the painting and that kind of damage is irreversible. We get a lot of questions about glazing um, and we were talking about glazing earlier with the example of the painting in the kitchen. Glazing is a term that we use for the glass or the acrylic used in front of the painting and it's sandwiched between the painting and the frame. Most paintings will not need to be glazed, but like everything, there's always examples, I mean exceptions. Paintings that are kept in high traffic and high risk areas or paintings that are in rooms uh, with higher light levels that need UV protection or like this example uh, by Wayne Thiebaud from the Spencer Collection, paintings that have high impasto that accumulate dust and dirt and are really challenging to clean. Uh, paintings with high impasto can also be tempting to curious hands that want to touch and pick at the impasto so the glazing will keep them away. I recommend using UV blocking anti-glitter plexiglass and I do not recommend using glass as it can break and result in damage to the painting and harm to yourself. You should dust your paintings regularly to avoid dust buildup. It's part of good preventive measures. Every four to six months, it's a good schedule. But before you do so, you wanna make sure that there are no areas of lifting paint that can snag off or fall off. Using a light that comes in from the site is a really good way to inspect a surface as it's gonna highlight surface irregularities. You also, you wanna notice any, um, if you notice any lifting paint, do not dust the painting. You wanna use a soft brush. They used to make negative brushes, I don't know if you can still buy them, but they were really good because they're really soft. But makeup brushes, some of them are really nice and you, can, you just don't want something that's scratchy or it's gonna shed a lot on your surface. You definitely don't wanna use a uh, feather duster because it's gonna scratch the surface of your painting. Or if you use a rag, like a cotton or linen um, rag, it can leave a lot of lint and streaks behind. So it's just better to use a soft brush. And you wanna start at the top of your painting and then just using short strokes and really softly, you wanna work your way down. And then always be careful and mindful if you have any areas of impasto. And while we recognize that we don't keep ideal museum standards in our houses. There's still things that we can do to mitigate these risks, this risk factor. We can mitigate this, re oh my gosh, <laughs> mitigate this risk factors when displaying and storing your paintings at home. The location is probably gonna have the biggest impact. You don't wanna store your paintings in your attic or your basement. These areas tend to not be properly insulated and have extreme fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity. Basements are also prone to flooding, especially if you have a pipe break. Exterior walls, so the walls around your house, um, also have really big temperature differentials. So you want to avoid hanging artwork there. If you do have to hang your artwork there, because that's just the perfect place for it, this would be a good place to use a backing board. You can also put little bumpers on the back of your frame so that it creates an air gap between the artwork and the wall. That air circulation is gonna also help prevent mold growth. You don't wanna hang your artwork above the fireplace because of high heat and soot. And then kitchens and bathrooms also have high temperature and high relative, humi relative humidity. And as we were talking about earlier, kitchens also exposes the artwork to grease. You can reduce light levels, like I mentioned before, using curtains and ex interior walls are gonna be the best place to hang your painting. You can definitely store your paintings in interior closets, but you wanna make sure that you check on them regularly for signs of insect activity or any mold growth. And also just checking on them regularly is gonna help with good ventilation. And before I turn this over back to Miranda, 
I want to leave you with this final image. People love bubble wrap, but bubble wrap does not love paintings. This is an extreme example of what can happen, and this type of damage is irreversible. Um, glassine is also commonly used to wrap paintings, but they're not a good material to use because they will also get stuck to the painting and they're really hard to remove and they, it will damage the paint layer. So I do not recommend it's used for paintings. So back to you, Miranda. Thanks, Bianca. Okay, so when should you consult with a conservator? We were talking about this before the presentation as well. Um, if you notice damage, as many of you, it sounds like, have. Um, if you think something might be dirty or discolored, also something that was mentioned before the presentation. Um, on a landscape painting, it's often helpful to look in the sky or at the water. If the water is green, um, probably is supposed to be blue and it's yet the varnish has yellowed. Um, if the clouds are yellow and not white, it's also probably the varnish. Um, we highly recommend having a professional examine your paintings before they travel also like if you're moving or you're lending something or if you plan on buying something and you want to have a conservator look at it first um, so conservators work in museums or libraries or institutions um, they also work in regional centers which have multiple conservators with different specializations who serve conservation needs of an entire region. For instance, Bianca works at the Balboa Art Conservation Center in San Diego, which serves the museums in Balboa Park, as well as other institutions in San Diego, private collectors, and galleries in the area. Then there are conservators in private practice, um, like me, um, who do contract, contract work for museums and galleries, and they also treat work of private collectors, like a miniature regional center. Our training to become conservators is very rigorous and specialized. So conservators will choose an area of focus. So be wary of a conservator who claims to treat objects, papers, textiles, paintings. If it's a regional center, they will have multiple conservators and each one will have a specialty. So that's fine that they can treat anything. But if it's a single conservator telling you that they can treat objects and paintings and paper, be really wary of that. Um, we are all required to practice under the American Institute for Conservation Code of Ethics. Uh, this places importance on documentation, treating all objects with equal care, no matter the value, our historical value or financial value. Um, this means that we'll treat a Van Gogh the same way we will treat, you know, the painting your grandchild did in art class. Uh, reversibility is really important. Everything we do uh, other than cleaning is reversible and cleaning is also reversible, but just by time. Um, and uh, continuing education. So just staying up on, on new techniques, etc., And promoting awareness and understanding of conservation and preservation. When you meet with a conservator, you'll wanna clarify your expectations. For instance, most conservators charge an hourly rate, although they may charge a flat fee for certain things. Um, everything that we do is done over after a lot of examination and testing, so it can be quite time consuming. Keep that in mind. Um, when you meet with a conservator and show them your work, they'll be able to give you an estimate, which will be a range. Again, because each treatment is time consuming and your painting will not be the only painting that the conservator is treating, it may be many months before you get your painting back. Um, if you have, if there's a reason why you want your painting back sooner, if you want to have it back by a certain holiday because you're having family over, because COVID is over, um, then just talk to the conservator about it and, you know, likely they'll be able to work something out. If you're comfortable with the conservator, um, they'll have you sign a document saying that you're leaving your painting with them for examination. Um, the same goes in a regional center. Um, they'll write up a condition report and a treatment proposal and a more accurate estimate after they've had the painting in the studio and they've been able to like really examine it more closely. Um, this estimate will be, and, and the report will be your contract with them. If you know, when you drop off your painting, if you know that your painting is covered by your homeowner's insurance or by your fine art insurance, 
um, that's good information to know. If not, and you know the value of your piece, that's also helpful when discussing whether to cover the painting using your own insurance policy or the conservator's policy. Okay, so how do you find a conservator? This is also a question that was asked before the presentation. You can use the Find a Conservator tool on the American Institute for Conservation website. The link is here at the bottom. It'll also be emailed to you after, um, after the presentation. Um, so you can use the Find a Conservator tool on the AIC website. Um, they'll let you search by area or specialty or look up a specific conservator. Or you can also call your local museum and they can give you a list of local conservators. They cannot prioritize them, however, but it's safe to bet that any of the names they will give you will be a qualified conservator. Thank you so much, Miranda, Bianca, and uh, please uh, join Jacinta and I and a round of, a, of applause. Um, I hope that that has answered uh, many of your questions and perhaps raised many others for you. So we've got um, a little over 15, uh, maybe 20 minutes for questions and any other sharing of collections that you might have handy and are able to safely handle. Um, I'll, I'll skim through the chat to see if anyone posted anything in there, um, but we'll, we'll turn it over to you all. Would anyone like to share or? So I have a question I'd like to ask. We acquired a painting about 10 years ago. It had been originally acquired about seven years ago from the artist from the studio in Paris. It was taken by the fan to their home, placed over their fireplace, and then the family retained a lot and the gentleman always retired to the library where the painting was for cigars. Now, I can hold an image up, but I can't get into the room that you can see it. Now, wait. My question is, it's an vessel frame that needs to be deconstructed. It needs to be restretched. The conservator that we've used in Kansas City, which is very good, it tested one small corner, but I'm saying it's really, she got a way to tell it was smoke. It was, how do you decide if you really want to take a piece that and have it clean and conserved, have a vessel frame be done, um, and it needs to be, it needs to be uh, appraised because the history of this painting is purely and but on, on the basis of one family that had. So I didn't decide whether you really want to go down that road. Answer to that. Bianca and, and Miranda, were you able to hear Jeff clearly? I had a little feedback on, on my end. I got it. I, I couldn't hear anything, no. Got it. I, uh, if, Miranda, were you able to hear okay? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's, I mean, it's up to you whether to have it treated or not. Um, often it's easier to, obviously the person who conserves it cannot appraise it. Um, that would be a conflict of interest. So um, it's often easier to have an appraiser um, look at it after it's been cleaned. Um, it can give a lot more information. Um, Jacinta has just added a link to an appraiser um, in the chat on the side. Um, so if you've worked with a conservator in the past and you, and you like his or her work, um, and you want it clean, I mean, it's all a personal decision. You, you know, you have to decide for you whether you want to go down that road. She did say that she wanted it appraised first. 
if it's what she believes it is, she won't touch it. So that's, um, you know, I don't know what it is. It has a Shigali look to it. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, there are a lot of projects that come in that make us say, nope, I'm not going to touch that because, um, oftentimes if things have been treated a lot or if it might be possibly a fake, um, then getting involved is not worth it to us, uh, financially or et cetera. Yes, it was because we purchased it from an attorney who was the attorney for the estate. All the family had died and everything was left to the housekeeper. And he was just getting a lot in Bogota, Colombia. The family lived in Lima. But it was purchased in Paris because of the, um, the man who purchased it. His mother was in school with the artist's wife. So it's, it's a tough decision. We don't, we don't really have anything but a wonderful story that the family told us about how they acquired it. You know, Jeff, your, your question is making me think also back to what Miranda and Bianca were saying about um, specializations. And there, there may be just a few conservators in our area and something might fall outside of their area of expertise. Um, Miranda, you mentioned regional conservation centers. And I wondered if, if one of the three of you could share where the nearest regional conservation center is that might have a wider array of, of expertise um, or how to kind of figure out where, where to go from there. Does that make sense? I think so, would Ohio be closer to you than um, Minnesota? Uh, the Gerald Ford Conservation Center in wow. Omaha is our closest uh, regional wow. center, but there is also the Inter Museum Conservation Center in Cleveland that Bianca uh, was thinking about. Um, a lot of conservation, well, all regional centers will accept artwork shipped to them. So if you want to continue the conversation with Bianca or Miranda, I, private practice conservators also receive shipped paintings. Um, you, can, you can work directly with them that way. Um, I am familiar though with um, most regional centers and private practice conservators will give you the link that I gave in the chat to contact an appraiser. And sometimes the process is to first go through the appraiser and find out, you know, is this something worth exploring, worth treating? Um, those kind of questions are, um, sometimes answered first through the appraiser and then you can work with the conservator after. Um, I've seen that, that workflow before too. But yes, a lot of regional centers are familiar with um, receiving work from far away. And I'll put the um, contact for the Ford Conservation Center in Omaha in here in just a second. You have to mail the painting to the conservator, right? Can you repeat that again? The painting would have to be mailed to the conservator. I'm sorry. Right, it, it may need to, well, you may find someone local and won't have to ship something. Um, I just wanted to add to that. Um, now in this virtual world and the age of COVID, a lot of conservators are doing virtual assessments. So you might be able to have a kind of like a pre-examination appointment with someone before you commit to say sending your artwork to them. Um, it's sort of like a pre-screening and you can talk about what the condition issues are, expectations, what you would like to happen, and they can give you a rough ballpark estimate um, pending reassessment once they see it in person because there's so many things that, for example, if I'm removing a varnish, I don't know what your varnish is soluble in. I would have to do tests before I can. Yeah, Bianca was reminding me that it's all about health and wellness and it's it's not that different from our relationship to our doctors and the way that we can have a, a virtual appointment with a doctor or um, you know, a, a pre-screening and, and how it unfolds from there is is not that different between paintings and, and our own bodies. I ask another question real quick. We have a priest tell us another piece we bought could not be correct when the artist had signed it because it was not a catalog or something. 
No. Is that the all and be all of a prison? Is the name? That's a better question for an appraiser. Um, yeah, it's a, better, it's a better question for an appraiser or a, cur a curator than a conservator. Miranda, would you it's mind stating the question uh, for those? Um, the, the connection's a little bit poor and I don't know if everyone yeah. caught the question. I only got the gist of it. Um, so it, it, I think there's a problem with the microphone. So your voice is a little bit jumbled, but um, it sounds like that he has another painting that the painting is not a part of the catalog resume. And he was wondering if that's, if, is that the end all and be all of, of a, an appraiser, appraisal? And I said, um, it's I, I've heard, it, you know, at least one instance where a catalog resume is produced and that turns up an additional piece. So, um, but but as Miranda and Bianca said, I think it is more a question for an appraiser. If uh, um, if the artist has an artist's estate, sometimes they're also um, a good point of contact and reference for that as well. Jeff, such great questions. Thank you so much. Um, Bianca, I know you had a question that came to you in the chat um, that uh, you might want to talk about um, in terms of estimating cost. Yeah, so the question I received was, in general, how much does it cost to clean, recolor if necessary, and then revarnish? And I am going to assume that recolor means in painting if there's areas of loss, and whoever sent the question can clarify my interpretation. So like I was kind of explaining, we need to see the artwork in person in order to do testing to give you an accurate estimate. The size um, definitely will be a defining factor in what the cost will be. If it's a small painting, it might be cheaper than a larger painting, but not always depending on what kind of damage it has. Um, so if, say, your tiny painting has a giant tear, but the big painting is totally fine and just needs a quick surface cleaning, they might come out to about the same. Um, so yeah, varnish removals, sometimes they're very easy and straightforward and other times they're not. <laughs> So that will definitely affect the amount of time that it takes to um, clean your painting. And then in painting, if necessary, and then revarnishing also if necessary. There's things, we get a lot of questions sometimes about, you know, you'll have a painting that has like a lot of flaking paint, but the owner's only concerned because it looks dirty, but doesn't want to pay for the consol consolidation, which is the setting down of the flaking paint. And, and there's parts of the treatment that we cannot move forward with until we've addressed other issues that are more critical, that are structurally important. Because if I go and start cleaning your painting and I notice that there's paint lifting, I cannot safely clean your painting. And for me, it would be more of a pressing concern to make sure that the paint layer is properly adhered to the canvas than if your painting looks a little dirty. You know, like the dirt on the painting is not gonna be necessarily permanently disfiguring. It can be removed at a later date, but paint loss, that's gonna be a much important thing to address because we want to preserve as much as we can of the original material. Can so- an example of that? Sorry, just to- Yeah. Is, um, we had a painting recently come into the studio that was really dirty, but there was a tear in it and they just wanted us to fix the tear because they didn't want to pay for cleaning. And it was a big painting and you know, whatever, your taste and budget is none of my business but um it was really difficult and actually took extra time because if you're repairing a tear you're using adhesive and to clean that like to get the adhesive up you inevitably have to sometimes clean the area so around the tear you end up with this clean area and the rest of the painting's dirty so then that requires extra time for us to go back in and own that area to make it dirty, appear dirty, so that it matches the rest of the painting. So picking and choosing, you know. <laughs> I've definitely been there. <laughs> yeah, we've all been, I mean, it, it, picking and choosing is really difficult. We had a question in the chat from yeah. Sarah Lynn. Um, she would like to hear about the thrill of conservation. What was a highlight for you? Hmm. <laughs> you know, you know that feeling when you 
fix something or you discovered something or you went, this is what conservation is all about. I want to hear about that, you know, that flow experience that I'm sure comes in conservation. Honestly, it happens all the time. Um, when I really love tear repair. So when, um, when there's a tear in the canvas, sometimes we have to uh, reweave the canvas to um, get the tension back in the support. Um, and that can involve like adding thread from, from another canvas and weaving it through using like dental tools and under a magnifying glass. And it's so obsessive and detail oriented that I mean, it's, it's, it's a total thrill and it's, I mean, uh, also in painting when you get the exact right color and you, you know, you've got this seamless flow from one area to another, or you painted in like these tiny, like hairline cracks so that the cracks from the original painting and the cracks in your fill were even painted, like match each other. And it's just, I mean, it happens every day. <laughs> I would like to add a good cleaning, <laughs> doing like a little test. And then you see that like a really drastic color change between the dirty layers of grime and varnish and then the original colors underneath it. That like big reveal is always wonderful. But then I also love to do technical exams and that's when you look at paintings so you saying like infrared or UV or x-rays or XRF and you find like all these hidden features especially when you find a painting beneath a painting so if an artist reused the canvas and you do an x-ray of a painting or if you do an infrared image and all of a sudden you see a ghost image behind it it's like oh my gosh that was a secret in the painting that we now saw so that's usually like a huge like moment in the lab where we call everyone and they'll come in and look at this yeah it's like being a detective sometimes Thank you so much, because I, I'm just assuming that you must have to be in the business often of convincing people that the painting is worth cleaning or worth, and, and it's not really a sales pitch for you, but it's, it's standing up for the painting. Yeah, you know, artwork has all kinds of value for people, whether it's financial, but also um, emotional like sentimental value is also really big and that always reminds me i worked in new orleans two years post katrina and some people brought in a poster that was in their house and the poster is probably worth almost nothing but it was the one thing that survived so it means the world to them so there's all kinds of meaning that we give to the things that we collect and that's really a lot of times it's going to be the defining factor but people go into it for all kinds of reasons whether it's an investment or a family piece that it's been in their family for generations i think we're all thinking about a lot right now um i want to be sure we we get to your question susan um if we haven't already answered it thanks for waiting patiently well, me yeah do you still have a question yes i just typed it in because i oh, thought great calling me what I, what I wrote down was how damaging to paintings is light bouncing around the room we have artwork in a northwest room and we always keep the west shades closed because I know the west light would be very damaging uh, but lots of light still comes in from the north it's not direct light but is this indirect light bouncing all over the room is that a danger to fading paintings and and prints um less so for paintings i can definitely i'm gonna leave prints to jacinta she's a paper conservator but for paintings i can tell you it's definitely less damaging than having direct sunlight on it because one component is the the uv uh visible light damage and the other one is the heat component um, so you're definitely eliminating the heat component if it's not direct light and it's probably going to also be like much, much more reduced levels of UV and visible light exposure if it's indirect. There are light meters. Um, are, are there sort of um, consumer grade light meters that someone could buy um, that would help them learn whether an area is safe? Uh, definitely. I've also seen people use digital cameras. Um, I don't know if you have, um, Jacinta or Miranda, have any experience with this. But, you know, your camera sometimes, although it won't tell you 
the exact level of light, um, it can sometimes help you. Mm -hmm. I've been playing around with some apps you can use on your phone or download on your phone and it's sort of just a rough estimate um, for works on paper you're just going to want to keep things as light levels as low as possible and then certainly consider investing in some ultraviolet blocking glazing um, because sunlight emits both or it contains UV and visible light, but we only need the visible end of that spectrum to see our art. And so that's why we, we use this UV blocking film in the glazing. So you can cancel that portion out by investing in some of that glazing. And then I would recommend um, rotating out your works on paper as much as possible. Uh, rather than trying to control the light levels too much if it, it sounds like it's in a pretty complex room and then you can enjoy it and then um, see other works more regularly. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Jacinta. I want to be respectful of everyone's time and it's right at 645. So um, Jacinta and I and, and perhaps Miranda and Bianca will hang on for a few minutes if anyone would like to chat more privately. Um, and there will be a handout that will come in, will be coming via email that will have all of our contact information on it. But we hope that you'll spend these coming months um, with your collections and uh, thinking about how to care for them and enacting some of the things that you've learned today. But thank you again for joining us. Um, more sessions to come in 2021. So stay tuned. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone.